Hello and good afternoon. We are live on University Radio Nottingham with the pic- with the big picture with Felix Hawes and Thomas Gregory. On today's show, we are joined by Damien. Hello, hello. Sarah. Hello. And Josh. It's an unexpected pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you to Josh coming in at such sh- uh, short notice. So today, we are talking about right wing conspiracy theories. We're talking about Paul Givens' resignation as the first minister of Northern Ireland, and about tax rises and the general cost of living. So first of all on right-wing conspiracy theories. So the reason why we're talking about this is because in the House of Commons earlier this week, Boris Johnson brought up the fact that Jimmy Savile was not prosecuted under the leadership of Keir Starmer when he was uh, chief prosecutor at the Crown Prosecution Service. Now, Boris was, or claims he was making the point that this was because, uh, he was making the point that Keir Starmer took responsibility for the failures of that weren't his actual fault because it happened beneath him. But people have made the links that this is a online right-wing conspiracy theory that Keir Starmer, as a man of the left, was, is involved in some sort of paedophilic ring. Uh, this has originated in America where there's some pizza gate, it's called. This, uh, there's an alleged pizza hut where Democrats are uh, have run a paedophile ring. Uh, completely un... There's no facts to back this up, but yet th- this is where it is. And... Uh, so, and critics of Boris Johnson have accused him of sort of fueling these conspiracy theories. Rishi Sunak has distanced himself from the Prime Minister by saying, I wouldn't have used those words. And Sajid Javid has said that Keir Starmer should be praised for his role at the Crown Prosecution Service. So there's some cabinet infighting over this. And of course, Bor- Boris Johnson's policy advisor has also resigned over this. And she had been with Boris Johnson for, since he was the Mayor of London. So this is a big name gone and there were three others others and another one that another an education policy advisor the day after that so it's all turmoil at downing street as it is almost every week that we are doing the big picture so panelists what do we think to this and um boris johnson's comments and right-wing conspiracy theories in general well um as you know from last week i'm no fan of the crown prosecutors Crown Prosecution Service at all. I haven't uh, had to deal with them myself. And uh, the statistic came out last week, as I mentioned, that only 6% of crimes are actually charged by the CPS. But this was an act of a desperate man. It was, it was the lowest politics we've ever seen from Boris Johnson. It's clear that he was on the ropes. This this um, Jimmy Savile story has been circulating around since uh, Keir Starmer became leader. Uh, and it's usually the only thing that you'd find on uh, um, inappropriate WhatsApp groups with memes. And it's come to the point where Boris Johnson has to use something like that to actually defend against the charges that Keir Starmer made. So I think it's a sign that he's really got run out of arguments because it was uh, pretty close to a full-on ad hominem attack with no substance. I think the the crucial thing about Boris, what he's doing at the moment, is just trying to divert attention with some sensationalist claims um, that are absolutely ridiculous. And I think that's it's kind of referred to as kind of throwing a dead cat under the table, just trying to distract from the Downing Street parties saga um and it's it's completely outrageous i mean it's it's a sign of the times because i think boris johnson he may have been able to get away with this at some point in his career but i don't think he can anymore so it is it's an act of a desperate man i agree josh interesting you mentioned the dead cat strategy because i once heard that uh boris johnson in that famous interview where he said he liked to paint uh buses in his spare time that was to distract from the uh, bus problems in London, which I thought was interesting. And also, if you were to Google the uh, bus, Boris Johnson bus, it might come up with these buses rather than the £350 million bus from the referendum. I can't imagine he's still trying to cover up for that. That was was six (laughs) years ago. No, no. Oh, but it is interesting. I totally agree with everything the panellists have said. It's essentially a distraction tactic and a low one at that. Although it is a fact that he was head of the Crown Prosecution Service and evidence was provided against Jimmy Savile. But his direct role in overseeing this evidence is, is, is the key is the key issue here. Yeah, he was not he was in charge of the Crown Prosecution Service when this came to light that Jimmy Savile that there was evidence brought to Jimmy Savile and the Crown Prosecution Service didn't pursue it. But he was unaware of it completely uh, at the time. He 
gave an apology just like any leader of any organisation would when there's a fault. But there was no link between him and the failure to prosecute Jimmy Savile. Uh, and these comments have caused a lot of backlash in the in the Conservative Party. Lots of, and, and has sparked further votes for no, uh, letters of no confidence in Boris Johnson. Uh, yesterday, Nick Gibb, I believe his name is the former school minister, um, he's now submitted a vote of no confidence. Is this going to eventually happen, this vote, or is this just going to be slow, slow, one letter by one letter by one letter, and we'll never actually get there until Boris Johnson leaves on his own accord in 10 years' time, or whatever it would be? I think Conservatives are really having to make a tough decision at the minute. Boris Johnson has totally ruined his reputation with the party scandals and he is toxic to the party and as long as he is in government it will be a problem for them and they will not regain support. The issue is ministers as uh, MPs aren't sure who's going to take over if there was a leadership election. They're not all big fans of Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak, the prominent people. <laughs> also, oh, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak will be hesitant to like deal the finishing blow as due to past experience and people who attempt to quote unquote assassinate a, the standing prime minister as the leader of the Conservative Party don't actually take the crown afterwards. And that's exactly what David Davis was saying uh, in an interview as well about how uh, his advice from Margaret Thatcher's best friend, what's his face? The guy, the one that nearly was leader but wasn't him. Hesseltine. Hesseltine. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Felix, for looking at me gormlessly. Um, yeah, well, Hesseltine. Best friend. So that, yeah, that, that, that. Uh, was a bit of sarcasm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Hesseltine uh, said said the same thing, and David David said the same thing. So I, I think maybe there is a, a bit of an awareness they don't want to stab Boris quite yet. Let him just die by himself or, or what I said which I've, I've said this back in 2020 I, I said I guarantee that people at the top making these restrictions won't be abiding by them this is just an opinion but this I was proved right with the, with the party gate scandal in and of itself that there's probably all the people that want his job were also at these parties and it's just a matter of time when they get in that they'll be exposed for doing the exact same thing and it'll undermine their legitimacy immediately I think also if the Conservative MPs wanted to get rid of Boris Johnson, they would have probably done it by now. Um, I think Partygate would have been enough to to push him out. So I think that he's just going to leave his own accord at some point in the future. I actually disagree with that purely because, well, there's a couple of reasons. One, I think Conservative MPs are nervous because if they go for the vote of no confidence and, and then lose it, Boris Johnson is then locked in as the leader of the Conservative Party for another year before they can challenge again. So I think people are very hesitant and just want to make sure that if all 52, 54 letters go into the 1922 committee, they will actually have the power to oust Johnson. And also the local elections are coming up as well. So if, you've got, if, you've got, if, that, if that goes really badly for the Conservatives, as I suspect it might do, are they not as bad as some people are predicting? If they've got that on top of the letters... I think that'll be the uh, that'll be the killing point. I and suppose no new leader wants to face a massive like electoral defeat right in the local elections. They'll want to come in after that to like swoop in and save everything. Yeah, I agree. I wonder whether any maybe Sarah might be most likely to think this. Do you think that this whole comment was a tactic to move the the debate? from the party yeah you're nodding absolutely absolutely it's it's, <laughs> it's a clear attempt to try and move attention back to labor because we all know at the, at the moment what a terrible state the labor party is in and by moving attention back to labor it just highlights it even more so yeah i would definitely agree with that what um, terrible state La it, labor it terrible is, state it's an, it's an what are you state uh, at the moment? Uh, exacerbate it's, why didn't they go for coal beach because they could have mentioned coal beach and tom watson the former deputy leader that was a legitimate um um conspiracy what was a conspiracy theory um, but that, that could have been a legitimate attack against the party instead of going after the, the dead cat of Jimmy Savile. But Savile. I think, to be honest, I think Tom Watson's links to the Labour Party, I think that's too the distant. The I think that's now. distant past now. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that that's no longer in the in the public memory, really. So I think that that by attacking Keir Starmer, it's a direct attack at the Labour Party. And it is in an appalling state at the moment. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm quite a dedicated Labour Party member, but I am struggling to, to kind of keep with it at the moment. Do you so. know when you get your emails from him? 
do you yeah. just and it comes I up, just I don't read them anymore you just, you just I don't read them the I, just, I read, I I read Angela Rayner's but I don't know oh. is, is that an endorsement for a future lead I don't know I was asked to att- during the uh, during the um, last local elections I was emailed by her to help and then I was told it was a women's only phone bank so I was like well I can't really help now so I was just, that's just the Labour Party getting it wrong they needed all the help they could get and they, they, they were more obsessed with identity politics than trying to get the mass effort into actually helping I don't think out. that they're more obsessed with identity politics I think they're obsessed with trying to get people opportunities that don't normally have opportunities I agree with you that at the moment we should be trying to get all the support we can but I also think that we need to be able to make these environments good places for everyone Josh but is when looking it's the actual Josh is the looking crux of the election you need you need all the effort you need, you need full steam from everybody in the party to, you can't it's not the time and just as a political tactician you just need to engage everybody and the dead cat is working because we are debating the Labour Party <laughs> and not the rubbish Conservative government. Yeah. Or, okay, look, moving back then to the Conservatives. Bojo tactics. I thought we were doing right wing yeah, conspiracy theories. We'll get <laughs> right. So Carl Beach again because I thought we were going to say right wing conspiracy theories to battering Labour. Labour. Yeah. Uh, well, it's e- yeah easily done. But <laughs> right, right wing, right wing <laughs> conspiracy theories. We're sorry for any announcement that you could be experiencing some bias radio presenting. <laughs> um, we ensure at University Radio Nottingham to keep our presentation as unbiased as possible. Thank you. Um, but back to the Conservative Party, often we follow, the, the United Kingdom follows in the United States uh, footsteps, and we've seen the Republican Party, which is more to the right than the Conservative Party, sort of be captured by this right-wing populism, which is filled by a lot of conspiracy theories, uh, particularly over the vaccines over there, and the, it's some chip by Bill Gates. I, th- I saw a poll that sort of like 40% of Republican voters believe that uh, the vaccine is a Bill Gates initiative to track everybody. And it reworks, um, it reworks your DNA as well, don't forget that. Yes, really of course. Thing to make you think more like a Democrat. That's, <laughs> that's the point. So do you think there's a risk, and this might be the starting of it, that the Conservative Party here might be taken over by this sort of idealism or do you think actually the Conservative Party in the way that our democracy works because it's parliamentary rather than all based on one person although we do have elements of that as well um, might prevent this from coming across to our political system? I think it it won't come across to the same extent but um, it it is it's happening we can see it happening I mean Boris Johnson he's he is a presidential style prime minister and I think that that is helping to encourage these right-wing conspiracy theories to to exist in our in our politics um well I think the collective psychology of British people uh, far exceeds the United States and I don't say that as someone that's generally snobbish about being being British over the Americans I don't usually like to put them down with the cheap sort of insults that you often get but I genuinely think there is a, an electoral hysteria that has been there prior, prior, just prior to Trump, and that was accelerated by him, and has existed throughout his presidency, and has not and has not waned during Biden's tenure. And I don't think the political environment, the situation in this country, is is at that level yet. And there, we don't really have people of that demagoguery to amplify it. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's not going to get that crazy. But uh, we'll see what happens. I think if you look at the 2019 general election, you can see that there was major hysteria among the right in this country around the potential of Jeremy Corbyn being prime minister. So a, a genuine fear there. A genuine fear. <laughs> is that hysteria or is that it, just it like rational dislike of his, yeah, his I don't, politics? It was, it was I'd, be, I'd be scared national. of a prime minister who was pro Hezbollah. That's pretty yeah, scary. Uh, right, that's that, pretty scary. That is. I mean, okay. That that's a debate for another day. Oh. But I think that there was there was a, there was absolute history about the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn being prime minister, which was encouraged by the right wing media. Was there uh, hysteria from the left about Boris Johnson being prime minister? I don't think there was hysteria. No. I, I remember um, there were there were huge anti Semitic protests that days up leading up to the election. I think there was definitely hysteria about Trump being leader. Oh yeah, that, I know. That was the back off the back of Brexit as well. So it was a, it was a, for the West. It was a, it was a collective time history. There was there was a question time at the O2 with two panels. People people don't seem to remember how intense it got in terms of the political debate at that time. It was it was crazy. That would never happen now, would it? An O2 debate on on leaving the European Union. It was more divisive than a general election, really. What do you think, Josh? If you'll allow me to go back to the US versus UK question, one don't get me wrong. I think the Conservative Party is in a scary place. And I do believe that they are susceptible to conspiracy theories. But if I were to search for like a nugget of hope <laughs> within all this chaos, 
I think it's deeply reassuring that Boris Johnson's senior aides are willing to quit over stuff like this, that conservative ministers such as Rishi Sunak, such as uh, Sajid Javid, have all come out and said they wouldn't have said it and that it was questionable. If you look at the US, Republicans just bow to Donald Trump and like every women fancy. And there's like only a handful who actually stand up to him. And we do not have that in this country yet. I have a challenge to that, though. Mike Pence has come out and criticised Donald Trump and said that we cannot blame that the electoral system was the problem and is wrong. Trump's Mike pro-vac- Pence came out Trump's and pro-vaccine anyway. condemned he, 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 Trump. He was, he was hesitant during during his um, the end of his presidency, but he, he's repeatedly come out and encouraged... And the other challenge is, of course, the Conservatives are not... Uh, obviously, you can't say they're I, conspiracy theorists against vaccines, for example, because they've been touting on about it and praising it as their biggest Thomas, success. I don't understand your challenge to do with the electoral system. Explain your point. Uh, that Mike Pence n- does not support Trump in in so far as blaming the uh, the twenty the twenty twenty election going wrong based on the electoral system. He has he has he has condemned Trump now. Okay. Two years later. Interesting. I would just go back to that point that actually Trump remains like the most predominant Republican figure in the party, despite the fact he's no longer president. And yeah. They're unable to move on, and it's looking likely that if he were to run again, he would likely win the primary, despite the fact he's espoused all these conspiracy theories. I, I think that'd be really interesting to see who would take over the Republicans. Well, particularly when Donald Trump now is being criticised by the people more to the right of him because he's pro-vaccine, and you've got people like Robert DeSantis saying, oh, actually, I should have been more critical of Trump with the lockdowns. And uh, for the first time in a recent... It was, I think, about a month ago, or early January, for the first time since Trump got the nomination for the Republicans, Republican voters have now said they are more loyal to the party than they are to Trump for the first time, mm, really? so it, it could be shifting. But Josh, you are—I mean, you are right. It is a sort of Trump has done arguably worse things than um, Boris Johnson, yet he's still m- far more popular in America than Boris Johnson is here. I read an article recently um, that said that Trump has about forty percent of the population that are loyal to him, no matter what. Whilst in this country, there's only about eight percent of the population that are loyal to Boris Johnson, no matter what. So. I don't know what how that that study was done, but that, that, I'm just citing that. That's Trump's, Trump's psychology is much like the last act of Scarface, where he's consumed with his own self-importance. I, I actually I think much like the United Kingdom, it's a very it is a very tribal system, and when it comes to elections, people return to their tribes. But um, just want, yeah, I just wanted to get back on on the, on the thing that actually I forgot what I was saying now. But <laughs> I think there is a point that American politics is is obviously more presidential but it is more central single figure than than the conservative party uh, the 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 british system so obviously in the british system there's going to be a bit more of a collective mindset with things and that might prevent against ridiculous policies of of kind of hysteria about Josh do you agree that power is what consumes the conservative party power is their only motivation that's why i don't think these conspiracy theories that have encapsulated America and, and the, the American right, I don't think I don't think they will because, like you're talking about, all the shufflings and the backstabbings that are being planned. I think that's always been the primary motivation of the Conservative Party. I don't think it's a party of principle at all, oh. and, and I think that I think that and, and knowing that the the British public aren't terribly keen on these far out mental ideas that and the fact that they're interested in power will prevent that spreading within the United Kingdom. I agree somewhat. So yes, I do. I think in this particular instance, it is working for the general benefit in the sense that ministers are willing to come out and defend them. On the other hand, if conspiracy theories were winning like they were in the United States, that tribal instinct just to gain power, and that's their primary motivation, would stop people speaking over their conscience. Oh, right. Well, I mean, whatever your opinion on it, we could be talking about vaccines we could be talking about people we don't like you can apply this song in 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 any way you like this is this is george ezra shotgun nice tenuous song link song link from me there get used to it because there's some more coming 
Welcome back. So our second topic is we're going to be looking across to Northern Ireland and Paul Gibbon, the First Minister of Northern Ireland, a member of the DUP, has resigned, which also means because of the way that the executive is run in Northern Ireland that the Deputy First Minister from Sinn Féin, Michelle O'Neill, also has got to resign and they've got to find a, a way of rebuilding the executive or elections will occur. I mean, there already are elections planned uh, in May of this year anyway, but it might be happening a bit earlier. Uh, Paul is not head of the DUP, that's Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, who's in the House of Commons. And the DUP has been threatening for a long time since he became the leader last year that they will withdraw because of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And uh, they feel they're not being listened to because... Um, the United they're Kingdom. not being listened to, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. But uh, the UK uh, is still following the Northern Ireland Protocol where checks are uh, some goods are checked between uh, mainland Britain and the rest of the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland. And they're not ha very happy about it, uh, and that's why they have withdrawn. Um, just before Paul resigned, um, Edwin Poots, the Agriculture Minister, had ordered civil servants to stop checking goods coming across, but the civil servants ignored him, and then Paul Given resigned the day after. So that's the situation in Northern Ireland. We only had an executive uh, reformed in January of 2020, just before the pandemic started in the, this country, uh, and now it's over. Is it going to? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think that the DUP are going to come back? What's going to happen with the Northern Ireland Protocol? What is going to happen? What do you think? I have no idea what's going to happen. I think that it just highlights the the weakness and the huge problems with the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, and it highlights the serious problems with Brexit in general. I think that this area of of Brexit, of, of what Brexit would look like, was not focused on enough in the uh, referendum in 2016, and I think it's 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 proving to be the most significant significant aspect of it. So I don't know what the solution is. Well, it depends on what you think the Northern Ireland protocol is for is it the preferred status of the economic relations between the eu customs union and the uk is it a compromise on the good friday agreement and northern ireland being out whilst the republic of ireland is in or is it to punish the uk for leaving the eu which any realist would acknowledge was in the eu's interest now um i wouldn't go so far as to say punish that's more of a tabloid way of putting it but it would be in the european union's interest to make it difficult but the other, the other issue is i've got a problem is is we've got the history of Northern Ireland here to deal with. And I, I know this debate shouldn't really get bogged down on, on, on that aspect of it. But ideally, if the country, if the, if the two, if the two nations had more, would you put ameliorating relations between each other, there would be customs checks on the Northern Ireland to Republic of Ireland border. And they'd be done there. But because of the Good Friday Agreement and that there is not supposed to be a hard border there, we're in a bit of a predicament. I don't know where the DUP is going to go with this. And Sinn Féin's starting to talk like old Sinn Féin. Uh, that worries me as well. I, I don't particularly like the way um, Sinn Féin has been talking with the with the sort of s the smirk of violence behind everything they say. And there's already there's, there's been uh, car bombs again, and the, the ghosts of the past seem to be circling around this. And it's um, that is quite that is quite creepy. Josh. Unleash Josh on the Northern Ireland <laughs> backstop. Let's go. Uh. I'll try not to rant too passionately. Isn't it ironic that the Conservative Party, a party with the word unionist built into its title, is the one which is tearing apart the United Kingdom bit by bit? <sighs> well, New Labour did the um, all the devolution. No, no, no. I've got a question not, for you, Josh. Yes. Surely, don't you think that the Conservative Party has has come to its senses? and retrieved the United Kingdom from the powers in Brussels. No. Uh, by leaving it in Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know where you want me to go uh, with that. Okay, no. No, no is, a fair, is a fair answer to that. No oh, is a fair answer to let's that. Let's just break this down. The Conservative government proposed uh, well, there the was Northern Theresa Ireland Mays. Protocol yeah. along with the European Union. And this was a system in which its goods are checked along the Northern Irish Sea between the UK, uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So the United Kingdom, the British government, has carved up its customs territory. So now we have a part of the United Kingdom which is treated differently with rules and regulations than the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, if you were Northern Irish 
and strongly believed you were part of Great Britain, I think it's totally justifiable that you'd be outraged that you are no longer being treated the same way as the rest of your country. But isn't that a better outcome than a hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland? Of course. In terms of infrastructure, for a start... Oh, no, undoubtedly. Yeah. But should we have imposed that on a nation which didn't want Brexit in the first place? What are you, what are you well, talking the, about? The British nation you, did, didn't it? What are you talking about? Voted 52%. Not, Northern Ireland voted 55% for Remain, I think. That's yeah, I yes. see. Okay. Well, yeah. A nation, yeah, that w- they would be a nation. Rather than a state, yeah. Than a state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, you raise a good point that the DUP are not very happy. They also say that actually the Northern Ireland Protocol violates the Good Friday Agreement because the Good Friday Agreement says that the executive should have a veto on things and because the Northern Ireland Protocol means that the Northern Ireland Assembly will have a vote on uh, the, the new arrangements with goods every five years rather than it being an executive decision, it means that unionists no longer have that veto because if the Assembly has a pro-protocol majority, it will always happen and the Ulster Unionist Party, which is the more centrist Unionist Party are also Remainers. So lots of technical <laughs> language, but um, so there is probably going to be a pro-protocol majority always in the Assembly and the DUPA as the predominant Unionist Party, at least for now, um, are not happy about that. I asked the panel uh, a, a question. Isn't hasn't Brexit worked? Well, because been a, uh, hold on, let, let sorry, me let me uh, let sorry. me let me elaborate on that, because on the one hand the uh, structures of the European Union were left which is what was inferred th- by, through the referendum you can challenge that as much as you like there is now the freedom to write legislation to monitor immigration a bit more and we still have maintained trade not only between Ireland and Britain but also uh, Northern Ireland and Britain but also uh are able to still check goods on on the borders that need to be checked between the European Union and and the United Kingdom. So isn't isn't the situation that we have now ultimately a a acceptable trade off for us leaving the European Union? Well, the, I, I I would I could come to a compromise with you here. One of the requests that I don't they, have an opinion. No, no, no. But one of one of the, one of the one of the requests that David Frost and subsequently Liz Truss has made is that all goods that are to be shipped to Northern Ireland and remain within Northern Ireland don't have to go through any of the paperwork because one of the principal reasons the DUP has has said the things it has has said and doing the things it's doing is because it's affecting the Northern Irish economy yeah I don't and I don't see why the European Union can't come to a compromise on that because it it doesn't it doesn't affect the Republic of Ireland in fairness to them they cut 80% of checks on goods going yeah yeah they have they have they have they have already but i don't know why i don't know why it's it's necessary to to maintain that it's about customs integrity right customs integrity yeah yeah if you make regulations in your country as to what goods you want to be allowed in and you need to protect those for example, like... But this is what I'm saying. Only imports that are going into Northern Ireland that aren't, that, aren't, that, aren't go- no, no, that aren't going. In all seriousness, how can you tell? Once it's crossed the border, if there's no checks, they could go anywhere. Well, the EU countries themselves well, no, you, don't, you don't, you don't only choose their, their, the standards either because that is chosen for them by the European structure, surely. You would stamp the European, you'd stamp the European Union products. Yeah. They but just don't they, want the bureaucracy. They get majority voted, so they, they, an individual nation would be able to choose. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> just saying stop I don't mind either. I don't mind either way. It's just it, I, I just love seeing people get impassioned by Brexit because it, it it obviously still has a legacy. You know. I think um, if if you're English, then Brexit has kind of worked. But I think if you're from Northern Ireland, then it most definitely hasn't worked because you are separated from the British mainland. But to be honest, I think we shouldn't be considering a second EU referendum. I think we should be considering a referendum on Irish unification. Ah. Ah, um, so so you've, you've heard it. You've heard it from here, Sarah Shepherd. Pr- anti anti second referendum. Pro Corbyn. Pro Brexit. With the Hezbollah thing, and now yeah. Sinn Fein as well. Fantastic. This is why I was scared in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to separate. Um, 
Sinn Féin and the IRA. I think that they, although obviously the political wing of the IRA. Obviously, they're they're linked. <laughs> absolutely, I'm not saying that they are that they're not linked. But I think at the moment, you so they are linked. Just, oh, they are linked. Yeah, but you can't you can't say that. Well, just because oh, just because just, just, j- well, just, just because Sinn Féin just because just because Sinn Féin has got some policies on mental health now doesn't really mean they've changed very much. Have you seen the kind of language they've been I, using over I the border mean, currently? I I do not support Sinn Féin. I can I, no, I I'm not I'm not a Sinn Féin supporter. However, you can see that that they they have changed since since the time for, of the politi- uh, for political relations they, uh, no they, they have political changed. marketing they purposes have changed. I'm not I'm not supporting any kind of any IRA activity any IRA revival but I think we need to consider a referendum on but, it, but if but if you could if it was just a customs border which is not the same as the same as a full border between two nation states there wouldn't be a problem here you could check them in the Republic of Ireland as they were bound to as they're bound to be shipped there that wouldn't be a problem but the, the, it's that language of we don't want a border in any respect. It's just a customs border. It doesn't affect the. It wouldn't affect the transit of people from the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. So I don't see how it would be in conflict with a good. It Friday sounds very much there. like you're on the same page. But but me but Felix just mouthed to me. But I don't have I an love an, I don't have an, <laughs> because, because we, yeah, we, we have love watching the debate. Like that. That's why we're here. We're, that's why we're presenting. We just yeah. we just got front row seats. Here. <laughs> so Sarah, do you think in Northern Ireland where there's a history of um, well, I was going troubles that that was no pun that was not meant to be a pun there but uh they have a history of um disagreement do you think a referendum is going to sort of reignite that uh more than it already is and when opinion polls are showing that most of northern ireland do want to stay in the uk despite brexit do you, do you think that the um do you think that would be wise to have a referendum on that as if it will reignite in light of a lot of how referendums have gone so, so far. far where it has sort of uh, caused a little bit of conflict I mean it's already got heated here uh, more on this topic than the last one based on uh, either Brexit or on the Union I don't think that it should be in the near future it shouldn't be in the next few years because I don't think Northern Ireland is in a is in a good enough state for it at the moment I think that it would spark too much violence um, however I do think it is important and it should be done in the next few generations I'm not saying that it's it's an imminent problem but it 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 needs to be it needs to be resolved i think it would consolidate opinion i think it would maybe resolve some issues i know the the period in the run-up to a referendum it would be highly (laughs) damaged shaking his head but i think that it would kind of consolidate people and slightly bring people together because we don't have long i I do want to ask you another thing uh you think that we should have an irish referendum Mm -hmm. well in that case should we also have a Scottish referendum. Yes. We've just uh, had one. Well, then, whilst, <laughs> whilst we're at the Scottish referendum, why don't you just make ha- Felix happy and and do and and do a a a, a fen a fen referendum, a, a rural party fen referendum. Yeah. But I think you why don't we just split the whole the land? Cornish one as well. Yeah, Cornish one. Corn. Do you want a referendum? Wales. Yeah. All right. Let's like go. That's actually a country. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Wales as well. Well, they're they're they're, <laughs> they're happy. They're fine. They're, 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 they're you know they're the, they're the biggest Brexit fans going, Josh. Yeah, they, yeah. They, so <laughs> I think I think you can't really compare Scotland to you know Cornwall. Um, uh, in in terms of in terms of I mean I'm from Cornwall and there's not I mean we wouldn't survive if we went independent. So I think that uh, you can't you I'll can't really with Scotland. Well, yeah. would, the, would the Scottish? <laughs> yes, they would. Um, how? I, I don't think they can't even. I tell you they, how. I tell you how all their oil. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that's Georgia. true. But, Oh, sorry. There were people outside the window who I was oh, waving at. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, gone fantastic. Uh, but I think from a Labour perspective, I don't want there to be a Scottish referendum. Uh, because Never have power be- again. Yeah, exactly. So, um, it'd be good and bad. Well, there we go. So, no no referendum for Fen Land Independence. That is a shame. Oh, I, I hate to disappoint you, Felix. Um, well, the, you know, it's all... It's all at the end of the day, I, I, do you know what, I'm not even going to extend this introduction. Uh, this dubious thing. At the end of the day, you signed up to this. <laughs> it is. Hello and welcome back to The Big Picture. That was Maisie Peters, you signed up for this. What a lovely song. Great album. Recommend Villain. Fantastic song. Uh, we digress. We're going to talk about tax and money and national insurance things like that because we've got a little bit of a situation on our hands interest rates are rising uh oil uh all gas prices for houses are, are rising uh national insurance is rising but don't worry the universal credit uh tax has 
God, the, the, there's a little tiny little council tax a, a, rebate which won't outnumber the amount that you're getting hiked. Isn't it? Um, Fierce, care to give us any more detail on that? Right, a series of stats that I've tried to find. Uh, it's all very number based, uh, and I'm not so uh, accustomed to it. Not doing maths anymore. But what I've what I've found. So we've got national insurance is going to be rising by 1.25 percent. So if you are in the main rate, that would go up to. Um, to uh, twelve percent for employer national insurance. So let's okay. Let's have a look at this. So if you've got a if your income is twenty thousand a year, that that's going up by one hundred twenty seven pounds for national insurance. So it was one thousand two hundred fourteen pounds, and it, this does increase per uh, t tax bracket. So if you're earning a hundred thousand, that would be an extra one thousand one hundred twenty seven pounds from national insurance from the original five thousand eight hundred forty one pounds. Um, also recently, with the cost of living, because this is going to be tough, and the, the Conservatives say that the national insurance is going up to pay off, uh, pay the NHS. It's going to be renamed next year the uh, Health and Social Care Levy. Um, but also we've got the whole crisis about energy prices almost doubling uh, re recently, and so the Treasury are going to find some more money from the magic money tree and give £200 discount off bills for everyone from October, all those that need it, I think, from October, but that will eventually be clawed back at a rate of £40 a year from 2023 onwards. So the Conservative Party, the party of Margaret Thatcher and cutting taxes, is rising taxes and also giving out money to help people as well. So it's, a, it's certainly a change of tune for the Conservative Party. What, what do you make of all of this? Well, it's what happens when you follow the Chinese Communist Party's lockdowns. It tends to be a have a devastating effect on the economy, and we're going to be paying the price for it now. Uh, I don't see any way out of this. Um, there's no magic, like you said, magic money tree. There's no magic policy that's really going to change this. It's a terrible, terrible news, especially for the working classes. It's going to be devastating. Not, 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 none of the council tax rebates, none of these grants are going to have any help because inflation's going up as well. Um, a friend of mine, you I mean you only have to ask around really at this point. You don't really have to go and consult um, the economist. People's wages are going up, but inflation is going up at a higher rate. So everyone's actually taking the wage. The wages are shrinking. And where do you go? It's, it's we might have to, we may have to get used to a lower quality of life or something. Something's got to give. We can't just keep pretending that we were the um, as well off as we were in 2019. Can we, I were, we were particularly well off then. Challenge sort of like the underlying theme beneath this question. Do you? Think that the lockdowns were a wrong move. Yeah, they didn't work. They co we copied the Chinese out of panic. We had a, we had we had a, we had a um, pandemic planned strategy out in 2019, and we didn't copy it. We panicked and copied the Chinese. I'm not sure we copied the Chinese. Sorry, I well, don't we, like they, that. Did, they did a lockdown. Um, they did a lockdown, and we copied it. They were the first people to do it, and then we did it. I don't think you can equate a pattern of they did a lockdown, so we did it. That doesn't mean that we followed their pattern. Well, within, yeah, within, within, just... within, within a few weeks, we decided on the policy, and it, it had not been agreed in any, in, any, in any strategy before that to tackle a disease. Their but lockdown was so different to ours, and I don't think you can compare them so also so similarly. If it wasn't effective, why did we decide to keep on bringing it back? wave after wave well, it's, it, that's an interesting point from someone that's been criticising the Conservative Party for the, for the, for the whole for the whole show and now because uh, it's a policy you agree with not bringing you, 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 no, it's something, something, like, you, something you agree with it, apparently they're really scientific about it I mean they were spending all their time having parties I mean, am, I, am I really supposed to sit and believe that there was, there was genuine scientific consultation on something that has never been tried before and you couldn't possibly model for having used modelling software myself IBM SPSS being one uh, usually the results are quite wayward even with a small data pool and when you're asked to model for the worst case scenario on top of that I don't see how that's even close to being scientific well do you respect they've been quarantining people since the black death like we're not talking about <laughs> yeah, we, don't quar yeah, really. we quarantine the ill we don't quarantine the healthy that's the fundamental difference Sarah Sarah what do you think as we should the government should be doing in terms of fixing the cost of living crisis do you think we should be nationalising energy companies, for example? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I am, I'm in favour of nationalising whatever you can nationalise, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, but <laughs> I think that it is the wrong tax at the wrong time uh, because it, it just it targets the wrong people completely. Because uh, um, uh, from my research, I can gather that the middle uh, middle in in earners are, are being taxed uh, taxed at the same kind of proportion to people that earn over a hundred thousand pounds a year which yeah. seems completely absurd to me so it's 
it just it targets people that are kind of they're they're kind of just about doing okay they're not they're not on the on the yeah that's what david cameron called it that you called them the jams the just about yeah, managing exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly they're they're targeting people that that are just about managing rather than people that um earn huge amounts of money do you think we should have a wealth tax Oh well, yeah. We should we should be ta- taxing people proportionate to their income. This just seems absurd to me that we are not ta- that we're taxing people the same, just on the same income. It's just completely crazy. But you get into that quagmire of a discussion over incredibly rich people will always find a way to domicile themselves abroad. So you would end up actually um, taxing people that do, do earn considerably more than most people do, but they're not millionaires, and that might have a disproportionate effect on the economy. And I, I, I agree, There's, there has to be some serious way of recuperating the cost of the, uh, lot, the, of the lockdown restrictions. But when it's the whole idea of taxing, um, I don't, I'm not saying you were saying that necessarily, but the whole idea of taxing the multi-millionaires, it, it always seems to me to be a bit of a, a quick-fire reactionary a, a way of recuperating costs without actually thinking about the bread and butter of how you would actually do that. Go on, Josh. I think you undermet underestimate the cultural cachet this country has. Like, this is people's homes. It's quite a decision to uproot just because of a tax rate. No, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just saying when, when people, um, not necessarily either of you, but when people use the re- rhetoric of saying we can just have a massive wealth tax and that will just that will just that will just fix everything. It would cause quite a bit of disruption, wouldn't it? Yeah, and there's, you can't. That's good. That's the sort of reaction of a demagogue. You can't just say let's have a big wealth tax. You've got to really think about it and how it's actually going to affect people. I've got an interactive feature oh. for, Ooh, for the. I'm going to. I'm going to play. Uh, uh, a bit of Chris Bryant in the Commons, uh, who Labour MP who went for uh, Speaker, um, who's uh, who attacks Rishi Sunak on the kind of level of the amount of m- rising costs that are coming in. So we'll see whether we can hear it. We probably can't. But Chris Bryant, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I know the Chancellor's all pumped up, but this is this is pretty puny stuff, to be honest. Yeah. Three hundred and fifty, three hundred and fifty pounds isn't going. £350 isn't going to touch the sides of the problem for my constituents in the Rhondda. Gas and electricity up for the average family in my constituency by £686. Fuel up by £314. The average weekly shop up by £385. Universal credit cut by £1,040. National insurance up by £150. And frozen tax allowances by him will cost another £300. That's £2,875 in a constituency where the average wage is £27,000. That is really going to cause hardship. £350 doesn't even touch it. And added on to that, I don't think he mentioned it, the graduate payback threshold's also going down, thanks Rishi. So not only have we been, in in, in Damien's eyes, the youngs have been, let's say, uh, disadvantaged by the Covid pandemic and will have naturally... A, a bit of time we'll, we'll have to pay back all of this in tax as future earners um, but also it's, it's affecting re- you would also agree that it's, it's affecting households so well the university stuff will that impact us like yeah direct- wow yeah our, our, our threshold has gone down because when we sign up for it when when we sign up for it the the what we pay whatever it is above nine percent above 27 28 29 grand a year but now thanks rishi is reducing the the price the the amount of money that we earn at which we start paying back which means that we may start paying back i don't know what the number they've chosen and also if you're a, a student they've frozen it a least. student from a working class family you generally have to be more involved day to day with your family than other people can um, some people are more privileged in that respect so it can affect you it will affect you directly so, I don't like. I don't so like it's not just the old with I, home. I we like, haven't I, got a bloody house yet. Yeah. And now we're already paying. I don't, I don't like. Se- I, don't, I don't like seeing my parents are at near retirement age, having their having their bills doubled to the point where they can barely afford it. What What do you do? I like, I'd love there to be a. So a, a my great my question may be to uh, Sarah and Josh, who uh, I I imagine are slightly more pro lockdown than say Damien is. How do you answer? Um, no, obviously there is the the oil and gas problem which in itself is, is the rising prices of, of fuel is a problem in itself but how do you answer Damien's challenge that the lockdowns weren't worth it and we are actually now paying and normal families are paying 
for the catch up from effectively something that would otherwise not have at least drastically affected the majority of young healthy people I think that um, in the condition that we're in, in kind of March 2020, uh, the condition of the NHS, um, I don't think that we could have, this was, I, I think this was expected, the kind of the rises in inf inflation. But I think if if we had been better prepared for a pandemic, if the NHS was well funded, and if uh, people weren't kind of living living in poverty as much as they are, I think that we wouldn't have this kind of, this situation. So I think that potentially it was inevitable with the lockdowns but it was because we were in a poor position before like with the lockdowns even when we had them in full our nhs was dangerously close to being uh overrun and and you say thomas what about the overcapacity nightingale hospitals that were never fully utilized and the fact that they cut beds because of uh, social distancing which could which could have been ignored and we could have been operating at even higher capacity we shouldn't have needed them in the first place because they cut the capacity of the hospitals due to social because distancing. Because we should have locked down sooner is what you're, yeah. you're going to say. Like, we're also not taking into account the cost of life. Like, I don't think we should be measuring all this stuff simply on economic terms. Yeah, but that might not fe affect the average... What I, my question was, that would not affect the average working working person I, no, the, I, the I, age the age of death of course and i know people who uh, who who died young from covid or have been affected by it uh including myself and my own lungs but that but my the, the question was how do you explain the trade off for these working families that say chris bryant was talking about well you could start by cutting the 5% vat on which you can only do. Yeah, I was I about to say that. Oh, I was left about, the European Union. I was about to say that. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Flexibility in economic policy brought to you by. It is very independence. true. Which is what's so insane because Boris Johnson promised it back before 2016, mm. and look where we're at. Right. Yet another promise of Brexit yet to be fulfilled. Well, it's more that the Tories hijacked the Vote Leave campaign. I'd, I'd, I'd come on. I'd come to an agreement with you there. But leaving on its own principles was was the right thing to do. But anyway, we're getting far we're saying. getting far from the point. Far from the point now. Um, so the NHS needs more funding. Sarah thinks we could have a a, uh, a wealth tax. Josh, what do you, would a wealth tax work? Do you think? I think higher tax on higher earners makes a lot of sense. My tax knowledge is very limited. <laughs> <laughs> Ta tax is, is high, but you, uh, anyway, for high earners. But, um, for example, the Green Party like to lump tax together, and thus they include inheritance in that tax. We could level. get rid of the Green Levy as well. That would, that would probably help. What was that, 20% of, um, all, all of, of your gross tax payments? We don't, why, are we follow, why don't we just use nuclear power stations? There's, 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 a, there's a permit and the, and the blueprints to build the small nuclear power stations throughout Britain. I'm doing a dissertation you, you, on, so you on, know, on environmental yeah, so you know, stuff. you know, but why can't we do um, that? Why, why won't and 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 there there are there are huge debates o over nuclear and renewables and the extent to which that is possible. But we're dependent Actually, on all. Russia. We're however, dependent on Russia. However, none of that is possible because we've run out of time. So there you go. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you, want, do you want to wrap up? Well, all right, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Josh, Sarah, and Damien for coming on. This has been the big picture with Felix and, and Thomas. Felix Hawes, by the way, in case everybody wanted to. It, it was another Felix that was it, on the radio. In case there was another one that you were mixing <laughs> him up with. Thomas Gregory as well. And Thomas Gregory. Thomas yeah. Gregory. You already know that one. And uh, stay tuned uh, for the next show, and we'll be back next week. Thank you very much. This is Money by Pink Floyd. <laughs>